Consumer Talk featuring Wendy Nola. Well, welcome to Consumer Talk and uh, today's segment all about honey as we meet or re-meet, I should say, a guest who is arguably this country's biggest honey connoisseur. Uh, We're going to revisit also some of the darker sides of the industry. We're going to talk again about issues like selling honey-flavoured syrup and pretending that it's honey. Uh, We're going to talk about fudging the detail on where the honey in the bottle is coming from, amongst other issues. So just an invitation for starters that if you want to join the conversation or ask a question or make a comment, you're very welcome to send a WhatsApp to 072-567-1567 or to give us a call on 021-44 six oh five six seven uh you're also of course welcome to tweet or x me at pjc hudson wendy great to have you back with us and it's also lovely to welcome back our guest who represents the much sweeter side of today's conversation won't you do the honors and formally introduce her please yes of course with pleasure so with us is natasha lyon as an l-y-o-n who is four ways based johannesburg for now for now and um, she is a beekeeper, a bee guardian, founder of the Lion Raw Artisan Honey and South Africa's first internationally trained honey sommelier. She's going to treat us to a honey tasting and also share with us her intention to use her certification to encourage beekeepers and small scale producers to share their stories and botanical footprint mm. with their consumers in order to firmly place South African honeys on the international honey stage where they clearly belong. Belong. It's fabulous to have you back again, Natasha. Welcome. It's been way too long. Thank you, Pippa. It's wonderful to be here. Thank and congratulations you, on all of your success in this industry. Why don't you start just by telling us a little bit more about this big dream that you have of, of using your passion as a way to put South Africa on the international honey map, if we can put it that way. Yes, I think I need to start by saying it really is a collective effort by the whole industry. And in October last year, our honeys competed through the um, Western Cape Beekeeping Association on a London platform, a UK platform, and they got a few awards. For me personally, when I realized... um, how diverse the colors, aromas, and flavors are. You know, Papa, I couldn't understand why don't we see this? And uh, my journey started about five and a half, nearly six years ago. Having said that, I do see a lot more differentiation happening now in selected, you know, sort of deli, sort of um, small-scale artisanal um, outlets, which is wonderful, but there's huge, huge room still for education. And and I wanted to showcase that. You know, it takes a, a... one bee her lifetime to produce a twelfth of a teaspoon of honey. I was absolutely shocked to sure. hear that it's that little. When you see it, you just have such respect. respect. Yeah, a lifetime to produce one twelfth of a teaspoon. And how long is a bee's lifetime? So the work of bees um, uh, is between five and seven weeks. You know, when there's a lot of nectar flow and it's windy, etc. you can yeah. imagine that their lifespan is shortened. Um, and if you compare that, you know, the drones are around the drone, the male bees are around yeah. uh, months, you know, months on end. It, it varies quite a bit, um, but they die off as we go into autumn. And then your queen bee can live between five and seven years. Oh, so granted the work of bees, don't live that long um, but the amount of energy you know that goes into making honey it really is something sacred um, and and there is room for your large scale we've spoken about this often for your commercial honeys there really is a market for that um, but I would like to see these honeys being differentiated and especially the manner in which we extract it that information needs to be transparent to the consumer because it can really negative or pa- negati- uh, impact negatively on the honey okay. right there's a lot for us to, to unpack today can we just before we do any unpacking though ask you about the little golden pin yes. that you are wearing uh, on uh, very proudly on your chest there because that is something very special isn't it Natasha it is um, and I'm, I'm <laughs> telling you you're not to be modest I oh want you to, to to actually let our audience understand just what it took to get that pin it it was a lot of hard work um, I I said to Wendy the other day I still go pinch pinch mm-hmm. it is a process um, you know in Italy I was part of the Honey Judge Guild in South Africa for a few a few months and they do fantastic work and I encourage all our local beekeepers all beekeepers in South Africa with you you know sort of small beekeeper or larger please enter your honeys in these competitions um, but then I discovered this course in in Italy and um, they are the world leaders in honey sensory analysis so in essence you use organoleptic all your senses to evaluate a product in this case um, honey so it was the the concept was found in in um, 
in France and it was brought into Italy. So I started this journey and, um, you know, I thought if I can just do one level one, what a privilege that would be. And but the, the people from all over the world when they share their honeys it's just like a bug bites you know mm. and i just was determined to yeah carry on with this so it's four it took me four years because COVID um interfered with that process a little bit and then in november last year um i sat my final exam it's an elective exam that you can choose to do and um it is a three day long exam that was really, really difficult. Some of the tests, we studied 22 unifloral Italian honeys, so only three of them on, are familiar to my palate, which Gosh. was sunflower, canola, and um, citrus, you know, or, mm. our orange blossom. Mm. But our orange blossom is so much more floral and fruity and intense, like oh, our wow. fruit. It's incredible. And yes, so 12, it was 12 students, and um, five of us passed. Um, sure. we, I got beaten by Scotland <laughs> <laughs> first and um, yeah, uh, uh, one of our wonderful sensory analysis um, experts from the USA, you know, um, a few of us passed, but it was also a bittersweet moment because there were fantastic colleagues that, that we've that walked journey. in. So it was so hard and one, you know, she wanted to jump it up and down. I couldn't believe, I could not believe it, but it was hard work. and. Um, it is a skill that people can learn, really. I mean, your your olfactory s uh, receptors sort of renews itself every 100 days. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's skills. And, and I want to part with these skills and so that we can have a panel of honey sensory experts in South Africa. Oh, that would be wonderful. Well, let's all shift around to the side. Okay. Let me just describe to our listeners what we are looking at and what we're going to be working through here. And then I'll come and join you over there. Natasha has brought in a set of six glasses that each have inside them a, a little portion of honey and looking at them it's like looking at preparing to do a dessert wine tasting exactly. with dessert wines that are getting ever more caramelized the longer down the line you go because one starts incredibly blonde in color and by the time we get to glass number six it's a very very dark colored almost sort of chocolatey um, uh, look to the, the honey so let me shift over to the next microphone and we're going to ask Natasha to explain to us how one goes about tasting honey and then we'll, we'll, we'll do our best to try and give you a sense of what we're actually tasting. Papa, you can join me in my tastings and describe the colours because okay. you're really good at it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the first honey, you will see, if the first thing that we do is we observe whether it is granulated, liquid, so it is a visual observation. I'm okay. going to go through this really quite basic and quickly. With wine, you swill the glass and uh -huh. that release the aroma, releases the aroma or the nose, but with honey, you smear it on the inside of the glass. I'm tilting it sideways okay. and I've got a little plastic sort of spoon which I'm agitating the crystals and when you do that, you are releasing or agitating the volatile oils which the bees bring in from the botany. And the volatile oils then releases. The honey that we are tasting here is a cosmos honey with lots of oh, weed oh, nectar wow. in. It is quite heady, it is floral, so the intensity is medium to high. And then we describe the crystals and what we see quite in detail so so in this instance you can see little air bubbles that's mm. been incorporated through the smearing obviously you can if you hold it up to the light you can see that there are inconsistent crystals they're very fine but you can actually see mm. various um different size yes. crystals right now this spoon is broken so i'll give you another one <laughs> okay and once you have released you know sort of this is a semi-granulated it's mm -hmm. got quite a smooth peanut butter consistency the the color is a light el uh, egg yellow and honey's come in a plethora of hues okay so papa you put the spoon on your tongue mm -hmm. there's a little blob of honey you allow your saliva to form around the honey and then you breathe out through your nose which releases that secondary olfactory so when we put our nose in the glass, mm. it was quite floral and heady. It turns more fruity, and you will notice it rapidly melts, almost like a mm. fairy just disappearing. <laughs> and that is very definitive of a honey that's high in glucose. And it gives you actually a sensational, a cool sensation. On So not mm. meaning it's cold, but that. So there's extra elements. It's not just the sweet and the sour and all these notes going on. But some honeys have got, is, a str is astringent. This honey has got the cooling effect because of the, the glucose melting. It's got the color of sort of golden straw um, or very, very pale blonde hair, if I can put it that way. And the yes. taste, uh, it, it tastes like a meadow, I want to say. I almost got a sort of a hit of sort of grassy 
Definitely yes. some florally tones, but it, uh, the first thing I thought of was grass when yeah, I tasted yes, it. Yes, it's interesting. Yes. So it is. If you have a look at our uh, at the, you, you've got a um, a, a little a wheel of, of tasting flavors. wheel like yes. with 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 other foods, and this is from the International Honey Council. And definitely, it starts off being quite floral and fruity, mm-hmm. and then it moves into some warm notes. There's also beehive beeswax, mm-hmm. and definitely, you're right. Uh, it also leaves your mouth feeling a bit dry. Um, yes, at the end, like yeah. salivating mm. a little bit, um, and you will go into vegetal notes, which is your dry grass, um, mm. yeah, sort of hay. So yeah. amazing, yeah. the complexity, Wendy, that you, you know you wouldn't think when you put a blob on no. your toast yeah, in the morning and, and go, it's honey delicious. Whole, uh, but but yeah. I, I've, yeah. I have just discovered though that I'm as useless at describing the flavours of, of honey as I am yeah. with wine. That's you go to a wine okay. tasting, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, it's well, nice. Uh, our lecturers <laughs> said to us um, when we received all the you know the information before the time, they said Pract- you can practice on wine. I'm like, yes. Oh, yes. This this is the best homework for me. ever. Yeah. Now the next um, one you've pulled out here yeah, is so, a blonde so the caramel color. So the next one it is. It's yeah. like fudge. a very light fudgy color, correct? Mm. Um, and if you have a look at it, the crystals is a lot larger. Do mm. you Much. see that? Yeah. And the pastiness it's thicker. Um, and um, if you would have to smell this honey, um, there is a little bit of a sort of. Yeah, the nose, the nose is, I just wanted to make sure I've decanted the right one. Yeah. It's it's a bit cabbage It's slightly, <laughs> it's slightly off-putting. No, I don't you think know, it if is. You know, if you let me agitate the crystals, it's, yeah. um, this was in the in the fridge last night, so let's just see. Just That's to describe to listeners, it's go, much yeah. more crystalline it's in structure more. than the previous one. And it's one. grainy, yes. grainy okay. to the eye, so it looks grainy. So there's a yes. little bit of a mustiness. This is a very rare honey. Okay. Um, so there we go, Pippa. Right. It actually makes it, rare. it sticks on. It is. Um, I'll tell you what it is. It's it's a carrot blossom honey. So oh. this farmer grows the the carrot fl- for seeds. He specifically um, grows the the flowers for for seeds. When we say it's a unifloral, okay, this gets not technical. You mm-hmm. may get quite a few calls going, oh, no, there's no such thing as carrot blossom money. It just mm. means, and we don't have, um, you know, we don't have the funds to test the pollen, et cetera, to okay. say, right, there's so much of this nectar in. So we pretty much go with the beekeeper's experience, but there okay. are many other um, nectars in. Now, can you feel how some of the um, fine crystals is very soluble? It disappears. Yes, and then it leaves your this sandy, cat-like tongue, right? Grainy. And the other thing is the crystals is not round. It's quite edgy and sharp, mm. almost unpleasant. Now, all honeys granulate, right? So some people think that if a honey granulates, it's a sign that it's a real thing. Unfortunately not, because even if honeys are adulterated, it also granulates oh you know so get to that. some people have yes. these little okay. little um tricks that they tricks. think are yes. the way you to do check. this yes. you do that and this yes. means and, and most of see them see if you can get that cabbage aroma now because it is from the it's from the carrot is from the cabbage family i'm getting something veg- veggie yes yeah, i, I you, don't know if i can delicious. quite get to the cabbage but i can't get to the cabbage but uh but I, I love the, it's I actually t- like that lingering crystal on the tongue. Mm. Yeah, the apiary um, is mm. um, on the other side, um, yeah, close to, to Hopefield. The next one, so from there we're going to move all the way to the garden route. And we have got here a, oh, she get away from the mic. Um, <laughs> so this one that we're going to taste is sort of the same color, right? Mm. It's, it's light amber, you. You can also see the different granule sizes, but it's a lot finer than the yes. one we've just tasted, but a bit more coarser than the cosmos and wildflower and and sort of weed nectar we've had um it is so the nose on this one is quite resinous but also it's warm you get like chai spices Ooh, cool. um, taste this one. and ideally you want to sort of also warm up a honey you know so i was going to ask because am i fridge. allowed to handle the yeah. glass uh, i know for example if you were tasting white wine it would be a no-no to put your yes. wrap your hands around it yes. um is yes. it okay to do that with honey you, need to, you yeah, melt it down you need a bit to. we ideally we actually each should have cupped mm. a glass of of um of honey before we take it so there is different there's some strong vegetal notes there's mm. also some resinous mm. notes and then at the end it's got a, f- a finish almost um like a burnt um you know cab brulee mm. uh, uh, um, cream 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 brulee yes. yes. thank you cream brulee mm. sugar fe- uh, <laughs> sense to it yeah it's got uh, and and it 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 lingers and then all of a sudden it just sort of disappears mm. But it is, there's a lot going on. It's quite a complex honey. That is gorgeous. But it's almost, it's me, a famous, me, me. yeah. No, you said uh, this is from the garden route. Yes, from the garden route, yeah. 
And and you know there's there's so many species in our in our book. We actually I think there's over nine nine thousand species. Is it? Sorry, I'm under correction for yeah. fanbos. Um, but the fanbos is really difficult to get a unifloral because there's so many things that yes. that nectars um, at the same. Now, just while we're lining up the next one, um, with one eye on the clock, I know we need to rush yes. through a little bit. Just for anybody who's coming late to the conversation today, with me in studio, besides Wendy Noda, we have Natasha Lyon, who is this country's uh, first internationally trained honey sommelier. She is taking us through a honey tasting, and you'll hear that the kind of terminology being mm. used is very much like a wine tasting. Very much like wine. Um, and the origin of the honey, the, the granulation of the honey, uh, the colouring is so different on each of them. Uh, if ever you needed proof that honey is not honey is not honey, that they come in immense diverse uh, uh, ranges, you would you would look at the table we're looking at now. Absolutely, For example, yes. the one we're about to taste is much more liquid and looks much, no much finer. There's no sign of granulation at all looking at this one. And you are shining a light through it and it's, there's wow. no little bit of yes. grand the, crystals at the bottom there, there but and the reason I'm doing that is this honey is definitive of showing up a red hue it's a buffalo yeah. thorn buffalo it thorn. is okay. highly sought after um, it's believed to be quite a med, you know high in medicinal properties minerals etc so the color of honey is contributed uh, both the pollen and the minerals in the soil contribute to the color of honey I think so we should have said these are all really your honeys, taste. right? It is. No, I no. work with beekeepers. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, I work with them for quite a while before I this. You, you have to twist quickly because okay. it's quite much mm. more liquid than the others. It's got a silky feeling. And we've skipped the nose now, mm. but often oh, when wow. people smell it, Papa, oh. they go, oh, not keen on the smell. It's a very definitive. Oh, that's beautiful. And then it turns sort of caramelly. I can taste it I was going to say it's like the outside of a toffee apple. Yes, mm. yes. Um, and then it's got that bitter finish again. Oh, it's beautiful. Like an unexpected. Mm. <laughs> and it's, it, there's some balsamic. The next honey, mm. um, I know we've pushed for time, but this one we have to this taste. Is okay. It is called a honeydew honey. So it's something that's quite new to South Africa in that we are not chasing this type of honey because because consumers don't really know we can't get the premium price for what it takes. But in essence, it is made from aphids that excretes. Um, oh. They puncture the plants, suck out the, the minerals and uh, all the it good, happens. you know. And then the excretions is a form of a sugary substance, which is collected by bees, pollinators and, and ants. Oh so way. this we sort of stumbled upon. But oh. this Aphid is, honey. your okay. mind will do a 180 on the nose. I mean, it is. I should have warmed it up a little bit. Oh um, wow! It's almost got a marmite yes, tang to it. You are good at you this. See you, <laughs> but you I just really got a whiff of marmite when I yes. when I bump my nose. I and I, okay, you, but now that you said, and I, I promise, the listeners probably think we've rehearsed this, but no. honestly, <laughs> Papa got this. I mean, Bovril marmite. Okay, and it is typical, typical oh, of a. Oh my goodness! It is a proper savoury okay. honey, meaty. It's got animal wow. notes. It's almost a bit barnyard to the mm. nose, you know. Um, after that, that meaty sort of. Bovril marmite. Wow. I'd love to taste that. Oh, that's then, so complex. Oh, dear. Mm. <laughs> and then um, what I love about this honey is it's got a balsamic, it's like balsamic It is incredible. Now, in honey, the only reason I recognize this yeah. is because one of the honeys we study I- in Italy is fur uh, honeydew honey and Metcalf honey. Now, remember, it's it's majoritely nectars that does not come from flowers. Okay. So it comes from excretions from aphids. Mm. And I recognized I it that was a thing. immediately. Yeah. Mm. There are thousands of different little aphids. So oh. this is quite gold, something. Gold. That um, is, I mean, a savory honey. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. If yes. It, I would never have imagined such a thing. So who knew that you could get honey from aphid excretions? Yeah, I've me. learned something new today, for starters. <laughs> I love this comment that somebody has made listening to us before uh, the break, taking a taste of those different kinds of honeys. The comment is, the complexity of honey makes me feel guilty for merely spreading it on my toast. Lovely message in from Jenny in OBS as well, saying, I have some very rare honey. Can you imagine that on the little island of St. Helena in the mid-Atlantic, there are bees making honey? There are bees making honey all over the world, aren't they, Natasha? But not always doing as well as we'd like them to. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Papa. We've got also different, you know, um, species of honeybees in South Africa. We've got two subspecies: Apis mellifera capensis here in the Cape, and Apis mellifera scutellata. Um, and yes, unfortunately, because of the huge pressure on on pollinating our food sources, they have been domesticated to be the key pollinator because we can move them around and mm. we can manipulate, mm. you know, sort of the pollination. So they are p- sort of um, trucked into all these different orchards, etc., um, and often. Exp- 
exposed to chemicals. However, we need to be mindful that the reason we do have our food in the volumes that we have is because of these pest control, you know, sort of substances. Yeah. So we need to try and move it um, to be more, you know, pollinator friendly um, and um provide the the um, sort of ecosystem that lessens the exposure of these chemicals to, to our bees. But it's very difficult. Here in the Western Cape, we are really, really struggling with food for our honeybees. The entire fruit and veg export is dependent on the honeybee pollination currently. Yo. And what has is, what is led to this dire situation? I mean, I imagine it's been a long time coming, but where we sit now, what is the main cause of that and what's been done about it? You know, Wendy, I think in essence, I mean, it's the good old explosion of population, mm. you know, and I think the way that we produce food this large scale is simply not sustainable. So there's a lot of, you know, pockets of research and, and uh, projects all over the world where they're trying to go back to biodiversity, you know, trying to incorporate the other pollinators that pollinate our food as well. Um, what has really made the problem lot worse in the Western Cape specifically is, of course, our eucalyptus trees, which is not indigenous to South Africa. There's about 200 species. In in um, in uh, Australia, there's about 900 species, and we know that some of these trees are quite thirsty. Mm. Sandby, South African National Biodiversity Institution, have done a new little booklet they've just updated that lists specific trees we are allowed to cut under certain circumstances. Now, why is this such an important thing? The eucalyptus is the single most important um, foraging food for bees. So the, the nectar, which we value in, in, you know, nectar N123, there's a book by uh, Martin Johannesmeyer, beautiful book on bee plants of South Africa. And then the pollen is also marked P123. So the eucalyptus trees is some of the highest food sources available to our capensis bees. And if they don't have the, the sustainable diet between these pollination, then we, yeah, we, we yes. cannot keep the populations going. But there's also a concern, what is the impact on biodiversity, you know? Yeah. And and so proceeds of part of the proceeds of our book is going towards WWF as they they're working on a bee and pollinator project for biodiversity and cons, uh, you know sort of conservation around these issues because we really have to do something about that. Natasha, while we're talking about the book, won't you tell our listeners a little bit more about it, please? Yes, it, it sort of started as a passion project. My friend Sharon Krause is is a photographer, and um, you know Papa she have taken over fourteen thousand photos um, over the past sort of four years and the, her photos just got better and better mm-hmm. and then she got given a macro lens from her husband and one day I said to her we need to show these photos to people and so the idea for the book evolved so she selected photos from those 14,000 um, photos that she'd taken the idea was to use the form of art Pippa. we've got these amazing PhD students unbelievable scientific research right but we don't put it in a vehicle for Mr. Public to understand mm-hmm. these challenges we are facing because really insects is boring right I mean <laughs> insects everybody knows the bee but beyond that really so we, we tried to do a photographic art book and it is all about the honeybee and what she may encounter on her foraging flight oh, so there's wow. just tiny little flower yeah. spiders that change colour there's a fantastic photo of a prey mantis because it's one of the bee's predators it's quite gory actually we, we were saying it should be put like a age you know sort of <laughs> warning on on that page yes and then and then i wrote i wrote the book it took us about four and a half years and then we tried to look for a partner where we can you know where part of the proceeds can go to to benefit biodiversity and all the pollinators so wwf is that uh, and and if somebody wants to find a copy natasha what's the title and where would they look for it um the book is called the honeybee takes flight we've just launched we, we've self-published um in in november so funds was an issue but mm. um there's a limited print um we in, in Cape Town, you can get it at Dalewood, Dalewood Cheese um, okay. from our website, www.lionraw.co.za, um, or, you know, get in touch with me on Instagram, Lion Raw. Uh, currently, it's it's only, there's a few going to, um, there's a book that's gone off to Spear and a few of the other wine farms okay. have shown interest because there's a lot of them that are registered with WWF. You know, so it's a book that beautifully can, beautifully can sit on your coffee table alongside the big five, etc., and educate. There's a conservation message. Fantastic. And that's the whole purpose of the segment today. One of the things we do need to educate listeners on is the fact that not all honey as presented on the shelf is In created equal. Yes. yes. Wendy, let's talk a little okay. bit more about adulteration. So I, I first want for us to talk a bit about the myths. Um, people have very strong ideas about how you can tell real honey from adulterated honey. And there are a number, of, if you Google it, I mean, 
these come from what would appear to be quite good sources. You know, they're published uh, by news organizations. So the one is you place a small drop of honey on a sheet of paper towel. Pure honey will not leave a noticeable wet marks and won't be absorbed rapidly. And if the honey is, it could be indicative of adulteration, possibly adding added water. Or fill a glass with, with water. This is the one I hear most often. And add a teaspoon of honey. Stir it once. If the honey is pure, it will settle at the bottom and won't dissolve. It may form a lump or settle down. Adulterated honey may dissolve and create a cloudy appearance. I know what you're going to say, but please, for our listeners, is there any merit in any of these? Or is lab testing the only way to know kind of for sure? Wendy, it is really lab testing, unfortunately. The um, the methods of, of adulteration is so sophisticated. I mean, they are even adding a, uh, one of the B enzymes is called invertase that's mm-hmm. responsible for breaking down complex sugars into simple sugars. They are even adding, adding invertase to the honey. So unfortunately, laboratory test. It is true that some honeys that's got really heavy, thick consistencies, if you you know do that, drop it in the, th- in, in the water, it sits there for a while before stirring. But really, there, there is no tricks that Hard you can authenticate. Mm. Unfortunately not. The best thing is to find your local beekeeper and ask our, our key questions from them. Well, that let's, will help let's you. run through those questions because I think, you know, we were yes. here to, to educate yes. and arm our listeners with, with you know, these sort of tricks, yes. real tricks. Ask these questions. What, yes. what, 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 what should be asked? So yeah. I, I think, you know, the, uh, to give a more sort of over overview, we, we produce around about 1,800, let's say 2,000 um, tons of honey in South Africa per annum. Our consumption is around about 5,000. So you can see there's a huge shortfall. And so it needs we, to come from elsewhere. So we're importing honey. Mm, okay, yeah. so on the label, as soon as it's different uh, countries, please understand it doesn't mean the honey's adulterated. Okay, we don't know that. There is a market for squeezy bottles where the honey is heated to 60 degrees because that deters granulation Mm -hmm. because mom's in a hurry you want to squeeze quickly for the breakfast and off you go but unfortunately the plastic bottles is not ideal to retain all the properties um, for a honey that's been heated and there's a lot of plastic bottles where people are mixing honeys literally in their garage it is one of the most adulterated products currently so have got their hands full South African bee industry organization so definitely if, if you're looking for a pure local honey and it says all these different it means it's been blended blended means uh, theoretically different honeys bending, blended together, not mm-hmm. necessarily adulterated, okay? If I could just jump in there, because yes, people yes. talk to me a lot about the labeling yes. issue, and the reason that our local legislation allows for it is is that you can't, because, you know, there's seasonality, there's supply issues, and so uh, it was to allow the producer to have one label, not print a new one for every different blend that they happen to have. So it can say from... And then and or, and that's the problem. Yeah. Uh, South Africa, say, and China, um, Portugal, or whatever. Nigeria, Ghana. Yeah, it Ghana. could be, yeah, yeah it, it, and if, you know, it, it could be that there's none of any of them or none of South African or, or whatever. Mm. It, it doesn't mean it's necessarily adulterated, but it does, it is. It should put a question mark there, certainly when it comes to China, because I know the bee authorities say, mm. according to the, the number of bees in the world and what the bees can put out, if you look at Chinese figures on what and the honey they're producing, it's not the two don't marry up. The bees can't possibly produce yes. that amount of honey on their own without some mm-hmm. help in the Absolutely. form of sugars. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely, Wendy. And I mean, you've done a few articles on mm. adulteration. You know, it's so hard to. I think the key thing for you know. Um, if a mum or a person you want to get the best for your family, ask key questions. Yes, is, the, is the honey heated? Okay. If so, to what temperature? All honeys are not equal. Okay. So we've established there is a market for your commercial honeys. And they're doing that for the reason you can't pump the honeys through your factory of a, of a, of a plant, mm-hmm. you know, unless you have heated it for it not to granulate. So mm-hmm. that's understandable. Um, honey should be heated to around about 40 degrees maximum, mm-hmm. not to impact on, for instance, the bee I- enzymes, which is a amino acids there's a lot of other properties in honey that is heat sensitive also ask if you can can get your retailers and people put pressure on them some of the big retailers starting to differentiate where does the honey come from in geographical area so mm-hmm. because of we've spoken about the security around apiaries you know the theft the vandalism it's a huge huge problem Gosh. so beekeepers are very reluctant yeah. to give the exact location okay. understandably yeah. but you can say it is you know a fine boss from Stillby's area or, or you know up in George or you can say it's a West Coast 
Tesco's. So I encourage beekeepers to start differentiating. Customers love your stories. Talk yes. about that. Share the botanical footprint. If you ask a beekeeper where's the honey from, and they, mm, uh, well, uh, well, then okay, did you buy it from someone else? Do you know the source? How's the honey treated? Wendy, all honeys are not equal. Okay. Yet we are expecting to pay the same price for all honeys. Mm. Your commercial honeys is often from pollinator. You know, you you bring in, let's say, your hives to pollinate the canola, etc., or sunflower, or macadamia, mm. all these large crops. The main income usually is your services that you give as a pollinator. The honey is almost a sideline. Mm. That honey is taken to the honey plants that they manufacture or, you know, process the honey, heated, and they try and blend it together because I think it's from the old school honey judging methods where the clarity of the honey got really high marks. Right. But the reality is that if we over filter these honeys some of them are filtered to six degrees pushed through like almost coffee sort mm. of you know that mm. even removes the pollen mm. so by by the eu definition of honey that is no longer honey because you've removed even the pollen that is mm. innately in that botanical and footprint has, has all the wonderful medicinal uh, you know so, well. yeah. mm. so so it's complex it really is and um oh, th- i must mention to you that this weekend there's a honey festival i'm so <laughs> glad you brought that up it's the big buzz honey festival at lawrenceford this week yes, yes. And yes. So it's a wonderful venue we're I'm super excited and Both please days. please support Three our beekeepers days. yeah it's friday saturday sunday um it's also the western cape beekeeping association it's their annual um you know meeting etc they've got some talkers um speakers sorry and you can book you can go onto their website or instagram you can book different. i know some of them are w- unfortunately booked up but then there is a beautiful honey and lunch pairing so last year we looked mm. at that and this is something close to my heart i work often with chefs they they get the flavor and aroma and i would select yeah. seasonal honeys describe the flavors and aroma give ideas for pairing but then it's really up to the chef so unfortunately with this one i i wasn't involved with this one and um, so this is a, a, a lunch for, with, with that they're going to put together with a chef. And, um, yeah, Papa, I think there's still seats available. And, and there was talk that they may only do a, uh, even do a second one for, for Sunday. Fantastic. So you want to just look the easiest thing because it's free to go in, but you do need to book. So the best thing to do is just Google Big Buzz Honey Festival and you'll find the link through to the page to fill out the form to reserve your space. And as uh, Natasha's mentioned, demonstrations, panel discussions, beekeeping advice Everything and anything you can imagine to do with honey from Friday to Sunday, 9 till 1 at Lawrenceford Estate this very weekend. Natasha, lots and lots of questions coming in on our um, WhatsApp line. You've addressed the issue of how to test whether honey is genuine. Fiona, thank you for that. Uh, Somebody also bemoaning, I love our local honey, but there is just so much fake stuff around. Some of it is barely honey flavored syrup. And yeah, I think a lot of people will will agree with that. Uh, Can you bring in bees from other countries? Trees, asks one of our listeners and mix them with South African bees to make honey? Bring other bees into South yes. Africa? No, we can't do that at all. And the reason is that, you know, you need to protect your bees because of bee diseases, etc. Mm-hmm. And also we, our capensis bees, have got an ability, and, and we explain it all in the book, with haploid and diploid. So they can actually lay fertilized eggs and they've got the capacity to take over other apiaries. Oh, That's also oh. why there's a line in our country round about an outswearing. We call it the integration. We've got a lovely map in the book, but mm-hmm. it explains why, you know, the capensis cannot go into a to later. So absolutely not. There's a lot of talk. You know, Australia often imports kinds of pollinators and, mm. you know, stingless bees um, have been, you know, sort of exported between uh, countries, etc. But no, that's not ideal. Um, and uh, no, no, we so okay. uh, yeah, no, <laughs> that won't for biodiversity. And then yeah. you've obviously made Daywood feel a bit inspired here because he's written in to say I live in the southern suburbs and I've got 10 pomegranate trees, all of them organic and huge and fruit bearing. I have a beehive in my wall. Is it safe to harvest the honey? Yes, I th- uh, absolutely. Um, you know, the the. In fact, what was quite interesting is um, for your your, your large scale pollinating honeys, they had that tested at the Upper Mondia, mm-hmm. and in a few years ago, the competition, almost forty percent of those honeys was disqualified because of the chemicals in it. Gosh. Um, oh. But yes, it is. Uh, you know, I would say it is. It is safe. Look, the bees are the ultimate alchemists. I believe honey, mm-hmm. first and foremost, is medicine mm-hmm. for us. You know, they they mix all these different nectars, etc., together. But it is. It is. Uh, something you need to be mindful of you know especially with with um, I'm now diverting a bit from from the question but the bees can fly between five and seven even up to ten kilometers from sure. the hive I mean that little insect a tiny thing. so yeah. you so that's why you're not you're not 
really sure exactly of where they forage from. And that's why sometimes you'll say, this is a multiflora from this geographical area, from the Free State or the Klein Karua or different, yeah. um, you know, sort of geographical areas. So we in South Africa, most of our honeys, this is important to remember, is really multiflora. Um, you know, in Italy, they've got these 22 uniflorals that we studied, but we have got nine different biomes. I mean, it is mind-blowing. And I encourage people, you know, find your local beekeepers and go and find those gems. Mm. Yeah. Yes. yes, yes. I believe we've got a question that's come through as a voice note. Let's take a quick listen to that. Hi, Pippa. Could you please ask your guests, how do we differentiate between a good honey and a bad honey? Do we look at the color? I need some education because I love honey. Thank you. We could probably spend two yes. hours on that question Answering alone. That question, yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I like to use the analogy, and it sounds like I'm bailing out of this question, but you know, how do you know good wine from a wine that's not that good? You know, So I would encourage um, everybody to taste different honeys um, straight from the beekeeper if you can. You really do get a good idea. And okay. you, you know, although there's no form of saying, oh, this is adulterated, sometimes we taste something and we go, oh, that's not. Unfortunately, with color, you know, color is an expression of the botanical but footprint. So it's got no indication whatsoever on the quality so of the honey. So glad we've, we've okay. dealt with that because yes. I think a lot of people do make assumptions about the color of hun- yes. honey um, which are totally off. Yes and um, you know sh- they're, they're also welcome to, to you know send uh, um, questions to, to Lion Raw's website. I, I really okay. try and answer and if I don't know I'll, I'd like to go and you know I'd like to go and research it myself because that's how I learn as well. Um, but yeah it's uh, try all different colors. They, you cannot look at a honey and say this is better than that. Just as, through. as someone who makes honey I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you this question for a 500 gram jar or bottle of honey for a for a good honey (laughs) what would you expect to pay because this is a big problem that the local producers have is that you're competing with a lot of stuff that's been blended imported whatever with sometimes dubious backgrounds shall we say so price it can't be the ultimate no. tell but do you have some guidelines around the issue of price you know it's very difficult when you after um after COVID, we saw one so a lot of the honeys just the pricing uh, got really high like mm. you know 280 rand a jar because then people go oh well at least i know that then is the real honey so unfortunately it's been very but what i can tell you is you cannot in my view and i've done i've done the costs and this is on a small artisanal beekeeper i'm not talking pollination right you cannot keep bees financially that it makes any sense for under 120 to 130 rand a bottle. Honestly. Okay. Well, how you know, big is the you, bottle? And this is if you, this 500 okay. grams, okay? So, and I promise you, I can imagine people doing flick flucker out there now <laughs> going, what is she saying? But you know, you have got a lot of hobbyist beekeepers that's got one or two hives, okay? Mm-hmm. Then all of a sudden they've got this bumper harvest. Now every tiny, um, every family member, the children, the teachers all got a little gift, but they've got a lot of honey. So they go off to the local market, but it's not their main income. And they flock it for 60, 70 rand a jar. You know, so well done, the, the, the you know, Mr. Public that snaps up that absolute, absolute uh, gem. Bargain. Yeah. But, but the, the guys who depends on this income cannot survive on that. Is And what we're going to be left with is pollinating honeys mm-hmm. and these artisanal, you know, guys are disappearing. We don't really have youngsters coming into it. In fact, one of the talks this weekend is yeah. on attracting young talent and attracting youngsters into this beekeeping industry. Natasha, I think we if we could clone hour. you <laughs> and send one of you to every corner of the country, we would have masses of people coming into the industry because you've made it come alive in such a wonderful way. And the passion you have for our local honey and from promoting it and shouting to the world how good it can be uh, is just so infectious. Thank you very, very much for joining us today. You've mentioned your website several times. Can we just f- finish by repeating that? Because I'm sure, uh, they, I mean, I haven't touched on half of the questions that came in from our listeners. If they'd like to direct them to you directly, where do they go? Um, it's www.lionrawlyon.com. R A A W dot C O dot Z A. What a clever name. Lion yes, roar. Oh, roar. Not a lion roar. Me, the lion. Yeah, the the c- insect. The bee is like the roaring insect of the of all the insects. <laughs> Love it. L Y O N R A W. Lion roar dot C O dot Z A. Or follow her at Lion Raw on Instagram. Thank you so much for the wonderful tasting and for sharing so much of your knowledge with us today. South Africa's first internationally qualified honey sommelier. It's been an absolute treat to have you with us today. And Thank all the you, best Papa. to you. Thank you. 
thank you. It's Natasha. really been a privilege you. for me. Thank you. It's really thank been you. fascinating as well as delicious. Marmite scented honey is going to be one of my favourite <laughs> new discoveries of the year. Lunch with Pippa Hudson on Cape Talk.